All right, so I have the super huge uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our first keynote speaker today. JJ Allaire um, is, in, uh, is a software engineer and internet entrepreneur. Uh, he's actually, I didn't know this, but he actually created the Cold Fusion programming language and web application server a long, long time ago. And, um, and then founded uh, a, a slew of companies, including Lose It, which helped me lo lose 60 pounds, and our studio. Uh, and, uh, and today, um, JJ is going to uh, talk about uh, Quarter, the success of our markdown. With that, uh, please take it away, JJ. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, yes, I'm going to talk today about Quarter, which is something that some of you may have heard uh, something, some things about. We've kind of had it in preview for the last year or so. And then recently, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced version one of Quarto at, uh, at our studio con. So I, I'm excited to get the chance to kind of take you through in depth what the project is, uh, how it works, um, and where we see it going. So at the highest level, what is Quarto? And, and you can think of everyone here, I would say, or, or nearly everyone here is probably familiar with our markdown. And you can think of Quarto as the next generation of our markdown. Um, and like our Markdown, uh, it's an open source scientific and technical publishing system that builds on, on standard Markdown. But it has some differences. Um, one is that the sources of computations are quite varied. Um, in fact, Quarto is built to be a system that is independent of a computational system. So whereas uh, our Markdown was tied to NIDAR, uh, Quarto also supports NIDAR, but, but in addition supports Jupyter uh, as, a, as a system for executing computations and can in principle in the future uh, support others. Um, Markdown uh, in Quarto, as with, our mark, uh, as with our Markdown, uses Pandoc, and, and uh, there's a huge variety of types of output um, that you can create with Quarto, which I'll get into in this talk. Um, and you can really think of Quarto you, you talk about it as the next generation of our markdown, but it actually sits inside a much uh, deeper and broader tradition of literate programming systems that started uh, with org mode and, and an S-Weave uh, and has manifestations in many uh, environments, including our markdown, but also not limited to it. So Julia has a system for this, IPy published, Jupyter book, lots of literate programming systems that handle computations, so Cordo. Kind of sits in that in that tradition um and and really um if you think about where this came from it really as i said it's next generation of our markdown it came from from spending 10 years in fact we actually announced our markdown 10 years ago uh, um, 10 years ago june in june um, we spent 10 years building our markdown extending the system adding custom formats adding features making it pretty, a pretty deep system. But um, one of the things that was a, that has us a little disappointed was that we, we spent 10 years on this system and it, only, it will only work with R. Uh, and if you think about scientific discourse and scientific communication and scientific computing, there's a lot of different languages and runtime used. In particular, uh, you know, the Jupyter ecosystem is extremely popular. And so what we really wanted to do is say, after 10 years, could we reimagine our markdown and re-implement it in a way that is not uh, exclusively tied to R and also at the same time uh, imp kind of smooth over many of the rough edges uh, that, that we didn't um, didn't end up loving about our markdown. And so we think about broadly speaking the goals of the system. One obviously uh, and something we've, we've benefited a lot in the R community from is computational documents which have the pr principal benefit of both automation and reproducibility. And I think we've already seen uh, in the R community how much something like R Markdown can help with reproducibility. We, we kind of hope to make this these benefits more broadly available for lots of different types of, of scientific publication. Um, this one, you, it'll take a minute to, to grok what it's trying to say here, but is this idea of scientific markdown, and you think about the different systems you might use to prepare a scientific manuscript, and you know, Word is probably the easiest to get started with, but as many of you probably can appreciate, uh, as you start adding in you know, computations and figures and figure panels and cross-references and citations, uh, it gets very unwield unwieldy very quickly. LaTeX actually is harder than Markdown and harder than Word, but actually once you learn it, 
it has really elegant solutions for a lot of these problems. Uh, and so we kind of look at Markdown as you, as you can see from this graph, it starts at a level of difficulty that's closer to Word than LaTeX. And, and then what we would like to do is it can, you know, you know, Markdown can be made to do all the things that LaTeX can do, but it's not necessarily a very smooth or straightforward process. So really what we'd like to do is have that green line start a lot closer to where Word starts and have a curve that's a lot flatter uh, the, the, way you, uh, the way you see LaTeX um, displayed here. So that's a significant goal of, of the project. And of course, um, single source publishing, the idea that um, for, for a lot of scientific discourse, we need to, to create uh, print output, we need to create PDFs, we want to create content that works well uh, in on the web, on mobile, that fits into content management systems. Uh, and the idea of, of having a single a set of source code that targets all of those things. Again, familiar, we're familiar with this from our markdown, but we'd really like to 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 really deepen our commitment to people being able to create uh, publications from a single source. So I want to address, hopefully I've, I've addressed a little bit in this in this kind of preamble why we're building a new system why isn't this is why isn't this just a new version of the r markdown package it's this you know breadth of languages and runtimes used in scientific discourse and obviously the popularity of jupiter um, the ability to grow into other environments later um, and i think you can really think about it once when you learn more about the system you'll see that it 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 it, it has a substantial resemblance to r markdown even to the point where you can can actually render most existing RMD files with Quarto. Um, we're really trying to bring our markdown to everyone. We're trying to make it as broadly available as possible, and but at the same time make it fit into the computational environments that people are, are already using. So I want to start with this idea of Quarto engines. There's several engines um, that that come with Quarto today, and, and others are possible in the future. The principal ones I want to talk about are NIDR and Jupyter. But we also have implemented uh, support for observable JavaScript, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the Knitter engine, uh, this diagram is actually an adaptation of the diagram that we've used for a long time to explain how our markdown works. And it's, it's our, you know, in the case of our markdown, it was RMD to Knitter to markdown to Pandoc to output. And really, um, Quarta works the same way. It's just it's a QMD file. And the, the um, the code that's sort of orchestrating the whole process is Quarto rather than the R Markdown package. Um, again, we're using Knitter under the hood. So everything you, you know and love and use within Knitter uh, still works. And as, as a result of that, um, most, uh, I would say the vast majority of existing RMD files you can render unmodified. So you can just say Quarto render my RMD and it will work and give you the output. Um, so um, we've tried to make it extremely compatible um, with what's with the code that you've already developed for our markdown. Um, I want to point one notable difference is that the syntax for chunk options uh, has changed. Um, we had a lot of struggles with the chunk options being on the same line uh, as, as soon as you started to create longer caption, sub captions, alt text. Uh, you ended up with very long and difficult to edit um, chunk option lines. And so we're actually using YAML inside the chunks, uh, as you can see demonstrated here. Uh, note that you can still, in, in when you're using Knitter, you can still use the old syntax that still works fine. So it's just sort of added in that case. But in the case of Jupyter, that's the only syntax that's supported. Uh, and here's an example of uh, using the Knitter engine. Again, most of this should look quite familiar, but you'll notice we've got um, this uh, support for cross-references here and the cross-reference is resolved. Um, you can see we're using the new style chunk options uh, and we're, we've taken advantage of a code folding option that you can see the code is displayed uh, hidden, but, but expandable. So that's using the Knitter engine. Uh, the Jupyter engine, uh, it, it kind of, the topology of it and the architecture of it is the same. You start with a QMD source file and instead of sending it to Knitter, you send it to Jupyter and Jupyter runs the computations and produces uh, markdown. Um, Jupyter, the Jupyter engine will, will support any other language that has a Jupyter kernel. So the ones that you probably most frequently think of there would be Python and Julia, but I've seen people have, there's a bash kernel, there's an EPL kernel, uh, there's a C kernel, I, I, there's a SAS kernel, there's lots of different kernels. 
and the Jupyter engine supports supports all of those. And so with Jupyter, you can use a, a QMD file, which is just like an RMD file, uh, marked down with chunks. But you can also, if you have existing Jupyter notebooks, you can actually uh, render those Jupyter notebooks directly. So I think I'll just quickly show you what that sort of hello world um, equivalent in Jupyter looks like. Similarly, we've got chunk options uh, in YAML. We've got this time a Python, a Python chunk, and you see the Python code, and there, and there it is displayed to the right. Um, and as I mentioned, it's actually possible to take an IPYNB file and render it directly. So if you're using Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook or VS Code or any any other uh, editor that produces uh, notebooks, uh, you can just you can say quarto render notebook.ipynb and that works fine. Uh, in that case, it's presumed that um, the execution of the code has actually already occurred inside your notebook editor, and so no execution occurs by default. You you can actually uh, change that default and and have the uh, the ipynb be executed as well during during rendering. Uh, and in terms of tooling, I'll, I'll get into all the different um, tooling options later, but it's important to note that um, if you're using Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, um, you can very easily load, load it up uh, and then just run Quarto Preview, and then you'll have a live preview so that as you work with your notebook in Jupyter Lab or VS Code or what have you and save it, um, the, the rendered representation will, will update in the browser. Uh, I want to <clears throat> briefly talk about observable JS. And for those of you who, who don't know about this, this is actually a, a Java, set of JavaScript extensions that were created by Mike Bostock, who also created D3. And you can almost think of observable as sort of like a shiny for um, a shiny for JavaScript and for D3. Uh, I'll give you a brief example here. This is a um, you know something similar to what you might see in a shiny application where you have a slider that affects a visualization. Um, and the interesting thing is that these are this this um, OJS is actually all done on the client side. So there is no server. This is all uh, all client and written in JavaScript. And you kind of see that uh, the, it's a very it has a very sort of shiny like syntax where you create a an input and you say view of, and now you can reference that variable when you're computing your outputs, uh, and it all kind of works reactively. So that's that's an exciting development. We we expect to see. Lots of people doing interesting things with that um, over the years. So one of the things that we've em emphasized, uh, one of the, the regrettable things um, in our markdown was that we kind of built this ecosystem up over 10 years. And you can see many of you have probably used uh, one or more of the packages on the left. And, they, and if you look at the features on the right, all of these packages had different ways of doing all these different things. Um, and so you, if you learned one, it didn't necessarily mean that, that what you learned translated to the others. Uh, and in some cases, like um, in the case of Bookdown, you could do cross references, but then uh, it was challenging to bring those cross references like into the Tufty format. Uh, we tried to build some interoper interoperability there over time. But the fact that we sort of had all these forks in the R Markdown ecosystem when, when you went beyond the, the core uh, R Markdown syntax really uh, ended up being quite confusing for people. So one of the things that we've done in Cordo, and I'll go back here, is to create kind of a shared core syntax for these commonly used features that are always the same across all formats. So some examples here. Uh, code folding, we now have a code fold attribute that if you you can either enable globally or you can enable per cell and it'll do this code folding treatment. Again, that works in presentations. It works in HTML documents. Um, it automatically knows not to not to do not to admit HTML and when rendering to PDF or docx, et cetera. So that's code folding um, tab sets. Similarly, um, we've got a single syntax for tab sets that kind of works across all formats. You can see it's you take a div and mark it as a tab set and then just use headings to indicate uh, the different tabs that you have. Uh, and the other thing is theming. Um, and this is actually a, a case where um, we want it to be compatible, not just within the Cordo ecosystem, but we also wanted uh, to be compatible with the R Markdown ecosystem. So we, we worked with the Shiny team 
who's got a big investment in something called BS Lib. Um, and we wanted to create a universal theming system so that you could create a, a single theme file, for example, for your company or organization or project. And that theme file would, would be able to successfully theme our markdown documents, shiny applications, flex dashboards, as well as Cordo, uh, Cordo documents, Cordo websites. Um, and this is, this is uh, something we're pretty excited about. We've also got the same core syntax able to theme uh, Reveal.js slides. So just to show you a, a brief example, is, this is an example of, uh, of using a, a pre-built theme and then overriding it with some various uh, things. And this is sort of this common theme file. So again, these theme files can work both with your Shiny applications and with Cordo and with Flex Dashboard. So hopefully that'll, um, that'll provide a nice avenue of, of enabling people to create very consistent and customized theming um, for, for organizations. And then we've implemented a huge number of new features um, in Cordo. Um, and I'll, I'll actually go through examples of each of these, but that's, you know, one of the things I think one of the big takeaways is while um, we're going to continue to maintain our markdown and we're going to continue to fix bugs and make, make small enhancements to it. And we, we expect, you know, to, to support people in running our markdown documents far into the future. When we create big new features in this ecosystem, we're going to we're going to put them in the in the quarter ecosystem, and kind of try to put all of our technical wood behind that arrow. So this is an example of some of the features, but um, there there will be many, many more to come uh, over the years. So let's let's dive into a few of these. One is cross references. And for those of you who use Bookdown, you've 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 got access to a similar facility. But the idea here is um, automatic resolution, numbering and resolution of cross references across formats. LaTeX does this very well uh, natively, but this kind of brings the same syntax to allow you to create cross references in other formats, including Word uh, and, and HTML. Uh, you can cross reference figures, tables, equations, sections, theorems, lots of different things. Um, so this is an example of what the render, rendered cross references look like. And I'll show you quickly what the markdown for cross references are. Here you can see a div that has um, is labeled fig elephants that has two sub figures in it, which each have their own label. Uh, and you can see here, I can just reference, uh, I can reference these and it automatically does the sub ref, sub refs. So that's just for static images that you might have. Uh, here I'm actually using another um, attribute uh, of, of a div to say I want you to lay out the contents of the div into two columns. Um, and then the same, same principle for computations, you provide a label for your, I'll do the knitter example here, you provide a label, uh, which is just like the, the, the label for a uh, chunk label and knitter, you provide a caption, and once you've done that, you can then resolve the cross-reference by referring to the label, and you can see here um, it's done that, and it also works for um, for subcaps and, and chunks that produce multiple figures or multiple plots. Here you can see I've, I've created a label and a master caption, but I've also created two subcaptions and specified two column layout. I show my plots and then you can see again, it's, it's resolving the main figure label as well as the, the sub reference, the reference to the sub, sub caption or sub figure. Um, and tables has the same sort of thing. Uh, with sub tables side by side, you know, you can have multiple tables, you can have computations that produce tables that are cross referenceable, and you can even have uh, the same scenario of multiple tables that are produced and then get their own uh, resolution and equations as well. So, cross reference is something that works globally, it works in any standalone web page or Word doc or PDF. Um, and also obviously works in books. And in the case of books, when you have a, an HTML book, which I'll show later, uh, it will resolve the cross-reference links across, across chapters. Um, there's quite, quite a few features for advanced page layout. Um, if, you've, if you've worked with LaTeX or the, the Tufty package in the R Markdown ecosystem or even the Distill package, um, you, you're aware that um, 
Oftentimes LaTeX documents can make use of the margins for both displaying figures as well as for content like footnotes uh, and even, even things like figures in the margins. Again, we supported this in the Tufty package, the Distill package, and um, Yiwei had a Hugo theme called Hugo Pros that had some support for this. So what we've done in Quarto is made that available everywhere. Um, and it's, it's a part of all formats. Uh, to show you an example of some of the things that are possible, you know, it, when, we, when an article is rendered or laid out in Quarto, the, the width of the article is uses sort of an optimum reading width, uh, optimum comfortable reading width, which is about 700 pixels. Uh, and that leaves margin space that's used, as you can see here, for navigation in a table of contents on a website. But um, you can also make use of the margins. For example, if you have a figure and you can see those, those side elements just fade away when, when, the, when, these, um, when these come into view, um, you can, for example, have a figure or an image or table that you want to use a little bit of extra space. You can outset it. You can outset it even further here to the page level. Um, same kind of thing works with the table where you want to have a very wide, wide presentation of a table. Um, you can actually go do full bleed things. If you've got things that you want to, you really want to make sure you use every single pixel um, or, or sort of a full bleed with an inset. And that's, that's, that's using the margins for kind of wider, uh, wider form content, but you can also um, place content in the margin. So here you're, we're placing a figure in the margins, we're placing a table in the margin, um, equations in the margin, and you can even arrange to have footnotes uh, uh, or even um, references uh, placed in the margins as well. So this is really exciting. We've seen people do really, really cool stuff with this already. And we think this really um, opens up a whole lot of possibilities for making documents and communication uh, more effective. I alluded to this a little bit before, but the idea of figure panels, if you're familiar with like patchwork or cow plot, you often need to lay out the content, figures, plots um, in, in some sort of a grid. Um, and what we've done here is we've actually um, generalized that. So you can use layout attributes on a div uh, and essentially say within this div, I want to break my content across rows and columns and you know how wide do I want each uh, column to be? Do I want to have any white space in between? Um, there's a, as you've seen before, a shorthand syntax uh, layout and call, which I, which I used before. Um, and that also works as I, as I showed before with code chunks. Let me see if, I, if that's, I think I've already shown this. Yeah, uh, you can say let you know for a given code chunk, you can say lay this code chunk out with two columns. But you could also uh, provide a custom layout if you had three figures, for example, like we have here. And again, this is similar to how cow plot and patchwork work, but it's but it's uh, very general because it can actually be any content. You can even have you know you can lay out equations this way or a table and an image. Um, any any kind of markdown content can be laid out. Uh, with this framework and the and the layouts work right now in HTML and PDF as well as in, in docouts. Um, callouts are really um, a really uh, effective way to denote special content, either content you want to make sure the user pays attention to, or or perhaps content that you want to recede a little bit and make it clear to the user they don't necessarily need to pay attention to. So. There's different levels of callouts. You've probably all seen these um, reading, reading technical books. Uh, and we've made these callouts work uh, both in HTML, but also in PDF, Word, and uh, in an EPUB. I believe they also work in, in Reveal.js presentations. Um, we also have native support for diagrams. Uh, and there are two flavors of diagram that we, and you can see the syntax for diagrams is very similar to kind of the syntax for, uh, for embedded R or Python code where you, it's an executable block, except for in this case, the execution is being handled internally by Cordo rather than farmed out to, uh, to Knitter or Jupyter. Um, here we have a mermaid diagram uh, and you can see it lays out, the, lays out the diagram. And then we also support GraphViz diagrams natively. Um, mermaid, if you're not aware, is a newer project that uh, um, is now also supported on GitHub. And so you can put um, mermaid diagram code inside GitHub wikis and issues and things like that, and, uh, and it renders the diagram. So we expect that to be 
a pretty broadly adopted standard for diagrams. And of course, graph biz has been around for decades and, and lots of people have, uh, are able to do great things with that. So diagrams are natively supported. Um, we also have a, a extension mechanism and, there, and there's various types of extensions that, that you can build right now. Um, I'll give a couple examples, but short codes are kind of things for including content, like including um, font awesome icons or including videos, things like that. Uh, filters let you kind of add new markdown syntax for, for, for extended features and formats are custom formats. So just to give some examples, um, there are some built-in short codes that we have. I won't focus on those, but um, there are a few short code extensions that exist now. Um, there, as I mentioned, Font Awesome and Video, uh, and then Fancy Text is, oh, that doesn't work, that's fine. Um, fancy Text is for including like LaTeX and BibTeX correctly formatted networks in both HTML and PDF. Um, filters are a way of introducing kind of new markdown features. You can think of it that way. Um, Let's see if I have any examples here. Yep. So we have some examples for automatically syncing tab sets. So if you, if in these examples where it says R in Python, if you click Python, the Python tab on one part of the document, then the tab flips in the other parts of the document, um, an extension for outputting custom LaTeX environments, an extension for doing lightbox images for, uh, or lightbox treatments for images. So this is really a, a powerful mechanism to sort of extend the core markdown syntax of Cordo. Uh, and then custom formats are similar to our markdown custom formats where you can create new output formats that you know, bundle together templates and style sheets and, and maybe even filters and short codes. Uh, and we've used that, I'll talk about that uh, briefly to, um, to enable us to create uh, formats for professional, uh, professional journals. So I definitely encourage you to take a look at extensions. The Cordo team has created a bunch of extensions and um, I'll give you a link later on uh, to another website that sort of aggregates a, a list of available extensions. Uh, another big investment we've made, those of you who've used our uh, markdown extensively have probably struggled with YAML where you uh, aren't quite sure why things don't work and um, Maybe you've got one small bit of YAML that's in the wrong place or has the wrong syntax. Maybe you get an error message that's completely indecipherable. Um, and what we've tried to do with YAML, I mean, yeah, it's really amazing that you can use kind of configuration properties to drive a lot of behavior, but it, but it can be incredibly frustrating. And so we've, we've made a couple of investments. We, we've created a schema for schemas for all of our YAML. And we've used that to build both code completion, which you can see here, and that, that works in our studio. Uh, as well as in VS Code, and then diagnostics, where if we know that your YAML is going to resolve into an error, we're going to flag you on that um, inside the editor. Again, that also works in both our Studio and VS Code. Uh, and then similarly, when you render, if you have bad YAML, we actually will create an error that says you have bad YAML, you cannot proceed. Um, and this makes sure that all of your YAML pretty much, as soon as your document renders, you know your YAML is clean and valid and not the source of any, of any problems. Um, We've also created an integrated kind of publishing facility, um, a Cordo Publish Command, that makes it very easy to publish content to lots of different services. We actually have a new service called Cordo Pub that lets you, uh, that lets you publish uh, blogs, websites, books, presentations. Um, that's a free service. Uh, you, we also have support for publishing to GitHub pages if you're using uh, GitHub or GitHub Enterprise. Um, support for publishing to RStudio Connect. Uh, and then Netlify, which is kind of a professional publishing platform. And it's also important to, to note that, you know, content created from Cordo, uh, you know, websites or um, books, which I'll show both, I'll show in a minute. Uh, it uses standard formats. It just creates a, a directory on disk that has your site or your book. And so you can actually publish, publish, publish anywhere. We've just provided some, some enhanced tooling for these, for these environments. Okay. I wanted to touch briefly on some of the advanced formats and this, kind of gets into the territory of packages like uh, Distill and Blogdown and Bookdown. Um, and just, just touch briefly on kind of what we've done for each of these. Cordo websites um, ha are significantly more flexible than, um, than our Markdown websites or Distill websites. Um, it, I'd say they're, they're on par in terms of flexibility with Hugo websites, but I think they're, they're significantly easier to use. 
Uh, you can have, you can arrange your, con you can have arbitrary depth of content and organization, multi-level navigation, you provide full text search. Um, I, I probably can't get into freezing computational output, but that's worth, worth taking a look at in our docs. Uh, and we've got lots of examples um, of web people, websites that people have built. Uh, the Quarto website is built with Quarto. Um, someone has ported um, the, the R manuals. Let's see if I can share that. Yep, R manuals. Um, lots of different, you know, here's a, here's a blog that's really cool. Um, so lots and lots of Quarto websites. Um, yeah, course websites, um, very flexible and very powerful. Um, books, you, you can kind of think of books as sort of an, an instance of a website and that you, that you can, the HTML version of the book, uh, looks, acts and feels just like a quarter website and it is in fact a quarter website. Um, but at the same time, books can also be rendered to, uh, single file formats like PDF, Word and EPUB. Uh, and in, again, as I said before, um, in the case of um, HTML, the cross references work across chapters. So again, we've got an example of uh, a few different books. Um, you know, here's the R for Data Science book uh, in Quarto. You can see. Um, and then this is interesting. This was um, I can do this again here. This was a book that was created from. Uh, I think the source code for this book is basically like eight Jupyter notebooks, um, but it's all rendered as a, as a book here. Blogs, again, is sort of a, a, a special case of Quarto websites, but it, they have the ability to generate listings of posts and RSS feeds uh, and a customizable about page. Our blog is running on this, and you can see some other blogs here. Um, you can see... Matt Worthington's blog. Uh, this is the listing page. And then you can see his articles. He's doing that. And you've got support for banners and categories. You can see he's using the, the margins. So um, very easy to create blogs with Quarto. Uh, and then presentations. Um, we have tried to create a really deep, uh, deep feature set for presentations. Um, it's it's based on Reveal JS, but we've we've heavily customized it to kind of optimize it, optimize it for presenting scientific content. Um, lots of features and and many features inspired by uh, Zeringen Extra. Um, I won't go through the whole thing, but there's kind of a demo slide deck that will show off like different things. You've done a lot of things with code. Uh, here's an example of transitions with code for when you're teaching, uh, line highlighting. Um, there's lots and lots of very cool features in here for transitions and fragments and it goes on and on. So I won't, I won't belabor that, but definitely check out quarter presentations. And then journals, we, 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 as we said before, we have a custom format system that's designed to, to create articles for publishing in professional journals. And the idea here is to, while at the same time, take the native LaTeX templates that are provided by journals and be able to produce LaTeX that, that is derivative of that, but at the same time have the articles be publishable with HTML by using spans and divs to apply formatting, in which case they're uh, correctly resolved to, to LaTeX macros in the LaTeX case, but then resolved to CSS for, for HTML publishing. Um, there's also a, a schema for authors and affiliations so that you can express that data once and then have it automatically formatted according to the styles that different journals use. Um, and then citation style language also kind of abstracts over how citations are rendered and presented. We have a whole section on our website about journals, and we've actually created a bunch of journal formats to, that, you can, that you can take a look at and play around with. And then we also describe here how to create your own formats. And this, this is for professional journals, but it's also, you might just want it for internal use, want to create um, uh, a format that makes very sophisticated use of LaTeX but allows the user to author in, in pretty straightforward markdown. I guess I can do one example here if this works. Here's an example of a rendered uh, JSS article that was created with our, with our JSS template. Kind of formats code and everything, tables and everything the way, the way that journal expects. 
All right, I want to talk briefly about um, tooling for Cordo. Um, with our markdown, we we made a huge investment in tooling in the R Studio IDE, and obviously we are we were doing the same for Cordo, but we're also trying to broaden the tooling story so that so that it works well, kind of no matter what tool you prefer to use. Um, at the at the kind of foundation of it is the Cordo CLI. That's kind of the core component that drives Cordo rendering. Um, and this, the Cordo CLI, uh, which you can download here, um, includes Pandoc in it. So it kind of has everything needed to render Markdown. It's a system level component, sort of like Git. Um, and it also happens to come with the latest versions of our studio. So if you have our, the, the July version of our studio, Cordo is embedded in it. So it's still kind of very simple and straightforward for our users to, to use Cordo, but then um, for those who want to use newer versions or control what version they're using or use it with, outside of our studio, uh, you can download and install the Cordo CLI. If you want to render documents with R, you'll need the Knitter package. And if you want to render documents with Python or Julia code, um, you'll need to install Jupyter. And then the RStudio IDE, um, I would say the current release, the, the, the July release, has Cordo tooling that is definitely on par with our Markdown tooling. We've tried to do all the same things in terms of rendering and previewing and publishing and uh, creating new documents and projects. That should all, all be there. Um, we've created a VS Code extension that has a lot of features. So if you either if you're an R user and you prefer VS Code, or if you're a Python or Julia user, we have a lot of the things you've kind of maybe familiar with from um, from our studio, you know, integrated render and preview, syntax highlighting, executing cells, uh, executing R or Python or Julia cells, um, completion, completion for citations and cross references, lots and lots of tools here. Um, so I definitely encourage you if you're a VS Code user to check that out. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, for Jupyter Lab, we don't have a plugin, but we don't particularly need one. If you're running Jupyter Lab and you run Cordo Preview, then as you every time you save in Jupyter Lab, you'll get um, you'll get uh, a re-rendering of your of your document. And then it's also important to emphasize that um, Cordo Preview is something you can run from the shell and use with any text editor. So if you just run Cordo Preview on your project or your document or your notebook, then any edits and every time you save that document in any editor, it will automatically reload. Uh, in addition to that, we we have implemented some extensions, and the community has implemented some extensions uh, for kind of popular editors. Uh, <clears throat> and I know that our Emacs uh, extension integrates with uh, Poly Mode and and ESS. And then, of course, we have the the visual editor, which um, you may be familiar with from uh, our Markdown. This has actually been available in our studio for a couple of years. Uh, the visual editor I can go briefly into this provides a, a what you see is what you mean kind of interface for for authoring Cordo file uh, Cordo and and our markdown documents uh, and this is I would say for people who for your if you're writing long form prose it is incredibly pleasant to to work in the visual editor uh, if you're working with tables and and you know resizing images it's really pleasant so I think you know we found that very experienced um, very experienced R Markdown users have enjoyed the visual editor, and, and I think it's also smoothed over learning Markdown for beginners. So that's uh, currently available um, inside the R Studio IDE, and that's again, it's available both in the uh, February release and as well with the July release. So um, I'd love to hear questions from folks about Cordo. I do want to let you know about some resources you can use to learn more about it. Uh, I've posted these slides uh, at the URL uh, listed there. I'll, I'll leave this up um, on the screen for a little bit for people who want to make sure that they get that. And I can put the link in the chat as well. Uh, let me just get that copy link. Um, but the, the Corda website has lots of resources for getting started. There's a, there's a nice tutorial. Actually, I'll show you what that looks like here. Depending on what tools you use, so if you're an R Studio user, there's a tutorial for R Studio that kind of walks you through how to do everything, and we talk a little bit about the basics as well as computations and authoring. Uh, but then that also that also um, is covered for other tools. 
Uh, the user guide kind of provides a comprehensive top-down reference to all the things that you can do with Quarto and how to use them. Uh, and um, there's a there's a, I highly recommend this website, uh, or it's actually it's a Git repo that kind of in the README collects links to things that um, that, that you know both educational resources, extensions, um, videos, etc. Kind of for learning more about Quarto and doing more with Quarto. Uh, and then finally, we had quite a few talks about Quarto at our studio conf uh, in 2022. Um, and those those talks are now available online. So again, if you if you get the link to the slides, you'll have the links to all these talks. And uh, and I, I strongly recommend um, checking those out as well. So I am going to stop sharing, I believe, and then I'll I'll try to put the link to the slides in the chat. Let's see. Um, okay. Screen. Okay. Um, here's the link. Okay. Uh, would love to hear questions if people have them. I'm not sure, uh, Stefan, how you like to organize questions. Yeah, no, that's a great question. <laughs> I'd like to organize questions. I should probably <laughs> have mentioned this earlier. There is a Q&A function uh, right next to, uh, it's, it's one of the panes. Oh, I see it, I see it, wonderful. Okay. And so, and so what I'm gonna ask you guys to do, starting with the next presentation, when you have a question, put it into the Q&A, because then people can also rate it and we can kind of go, to question, go down the questions uh, in a okay. priority fashion. Uh, however, for now, we actually do have quite a bit of time left for questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a QA and a and then I'm going to just go down the chat and see what people Sounds have. good. Sounds good. Great. So um, so Raymond uh, Belize is asking, uh, what's the URL for the slides? I think we answered that. I put that in the is, chat. Yep. Is there a plan to add Quarto support or integration for the Learn R package? And then uh, uh, three pleases afterwards. Uh, um, the Learn R package uh, it makes very heavy use of a lot of hooks in R Markdown. So we could do something like the Learn R package, but um, and probably will at some point. But the literally the Learn R package working in Quarto, that's probably not something that's going to happen soon. I'll be honest about that. Okay. Then John Rubin is asking, could you talk a bit more about what's required for doing mermaid diagrams? Yeah, so a mermaid diet, you basically can just add that mermaid, that mermaid uh, cell or chunk. Um, we have the, the, the mermaid JavaScript runtime is integrated into, into Quarto. So you don't, there's no other requirement other than putting the mermaid code in there and rendering. Um, I know that our studio and VS Code both actually have some support for, um, for previewing of, of mermaid uh, diagrams. Um, there's an option for um, if you want to include mermaid diagrams in like a, in like a PDF, uh, that actually works. We, we actually um, will we'll, um, use <clears throat> and, and sort of use your local version of Chrome to kind of take a screenshot of the mermaid diagram uh, and put, put that inside a PDF or, or a docx. So mermaid diagrams should generally work um, across formats, even though they're kind of fundamentally a web, tech, a web technology. Okay, great. New more questions are filing in. Um, on a Red Hat Linux install with Quarter, do you need Jupyter installed to be able to run a Quarter report with both R and Python? Uh, so no, R installed? Good, good question. Uh, no, I mean basically, if you're using NIDR with Reticulate, if that's how you're doing your Python, then you don't need Jupyter. Um, you can just continue using Reticulate. Um, so, uh, no Jupyter requirement if you're doing like a hybrid R and Python document. Okay, uh, so I'm going to continue with one of my questions, my yep. que <laughs> and okay. then I'm going to jump back into the Q and A. Um, so the uh, uh, the uh, visual editor, R Studio visual editor, has been transformed for how I, you know, for for yep. for how I do uh, uh, data science, data science teaching, um, uh, most of all things, and how accepting people are of of using uh, R Studio as a, a as as a platform to do stuff here in, in medicine. What I'm wondering is whether there are any plans to ever um, do something like that, but for presentations. Is there going to be a visual yes. slide editor? Yes. Uh, yeah, we're going to do quite a bit with the visual editor, and you will see it outside of our studio as well. Mm -hmm. So you'll, you'll see it in, a, in just in a standalone web browser. 
um, maybe in VS Code. Uh, and part of that work will be to create a, a slide editing mode that will be okay. more traditional. Uh, that so that's we're we're going to work on that. Uh, it, it it is technically pretty demanding to get all that done, but it's definitely on our roadmap in our plans and something we will we will ultimately do. Awesome. Okay, so there's a few more questions. Uh, fun question for our mark dumb. We knit a render report. Yep. What is the equivalent term for running a quarter report? Render. It's rent. Everything's render. Yep. Yeah. You'll see that in our studio it says render, quarter render. So it's called render. Any suggestions on how to convert a blog down based website to Quarto? Um, if if I'm not yeah. mistaken, YAMLs are quite different yeah. sure about how interchangeable. Yeah. What, what I would do is I would just start a start, get your Quarto website started and build kind of create the nav structure you want with kind of just like an empty website. And then I would just take the, the, the really the thing that you're going to be able to convert are the RMDs and the MD files. And you want to pour the, you know, you, you, you it's, you're not going to be able to, there's no real viable like automated conversion from one to the other because Hugo is a very, very different system. Um, and so it's not just like, oh, rename a couple things and run a converter. Um, but I would just say, get your new website, arrange how you want it, and then just take the individual articles and then port, port them over. So start with a blank slate and then and then transfer yeah. your content. Yeah, that, yeah. That makes that's sense. Yeah. Cool. Susan Holmes is asking, how easy is it to tailor to PDF for Printed books, which have also been made in HTML. What do you recommend? Uh, yes, uh, um, yes. So, re the, the, if you look at the the Quarto Journals section of the website, that really gives a, a clear, and as well as some of the examples of journal formats we've created, that kind of gives you a roadmap for how we think about doing this. And really, the key is, you know, we've tried to make some of the grid system and layout system available for both HTML and PDF. And we tried to emphasize using, you know, more abstracted, you know, divs and spans that will work both, both in PDF and HTML. I would say, uh, and, and a lot of those formats we do show we have HTML versions along with PDF versions. So I think with some uh, some concerted effort and care, you can make books that work really, really well in both HTML and PDF. Okay, and I think there's there's probably some examples out there where this has there, been done. There are examples, and we are, and it is still. So we are using uh, X uh, XE LaTeX. Mm. So it does use LaTeX. We are going to invest um, in the next year or so some more in paged HTML, which you, people may be familiar with from uh, page down. Uh, and so that's another way to get to PDF, where you're not using LaTeX, you're using kind of HTML to create to agree high quality printed output. So that may be another path for a book. It really depends on if, if publishers are looking for LaTeX, then you, you know that's not going to be an option. But if the publisher says, just give me a PDF, um, it's hard to say. But so we will, we, we, rec we recognize that, that there are pros and cons to LaTeX versus like paged HTML. And so we'll, we'll ultimately support both. Uh, Mikael uh, asks, would Quoto be able to sometime uh, uh, generate documentation websites yeah. for R packages, Roxygen, Python, Docstring, and Julia? Yes. Uh, so there is already a project called EcoDown that is um, that's used internally by by our studio. It's it's a public open source package, but we haven't promoted it a lot. And the concept of EcoDown is like it's the it's the notion is there's like an ecosystem of packages. So in the case, in the case of like TensorFlow, Spark, mm -hmm. Torch, where we have a whole bunch of different packages that we want to put a website together, but also have the reference and everything. So EcoDown allows you to do that and actually uses, it uses like the package down config file to kind of drive how everything works. So that's, uh, that's an example. And I do know there are some people uh, just looking in the RStudio Slack internally working on doing a doc string based thing. Uh, there's, there's at least a couple people trying to figure out how to do that well. So I'd expect there will be some, some way to do that. Um, we currently don't have anything in Quarto proper, but then but there are all these other sort of external projects that are working on it. I see. So no, no, no uh, so package down uh, doesn't, doesn't currently support. No, Quarto. But, but eco down kind of it basically kind of uses package down. So so EcoDown just sort of says, okay, you want to, you have package down, but there's seven packages. And so you want to have all those packages. Also, mm -hmm. you want to have like integrative material, uh, you know, as well, like the TensorFlow is a good example. Um, so. 
Uh, Raymond has another question. Is there actually a, I'd be interested in this as well? Is there a plan for adding word like track changes for quarter docs for our colleagues, yes. colleagues who don't know Git? Yes, absolutely. We're, we're going awesome. to look at them. That's yeah. like that's sort of the the vector of the visual editor to sort of make this whole world of scientific markdown accessible to to people who are not coders or you know right. or, or you know. Uh, that that is that is a huge priority for us. Yeah, so. it is. A, it is a, I want to reiterate that as a clinical researcher myself, this is tra track changes is is yeah. is completely yep. essential to uh, uh, my workflow. Yep. And yeah, but we're, and, we're gonna we are gonna definitely gonna work on that. Yes. And then uh, Joe has a has a has a question that I think you can probably answer in two uh, in two uh, sentences. What is your big picture vision for Quarto? Well, I think we want to transform the way people. Um, do scientific communication. Uh, and I think that is it, what I focused on today is sort of at a practical level, how you incorporate computations and are reproducible and do multi-format things. But I think there's a lot of innovation that is still to come by, by various communities about how scientific communication and academic publishing work. And we'd like to be a part of, eventually be a part of facilitating some of that innovation through, through our tools. Yeah, so I want to follow up on this uh, real quick with another question. Uh, so there have been some uh, some efforts to try to encapsulate um, uh, reproducible environments in a yeah. in a fashion uh, that make it easy for peer reviewers or for colleagues to yeah. to rerun the analyses. Uh, so uh, one, uh, I think, uh, Code Ocean has Capsule. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, and then there was uh, the R Open Sci community uh, put together. Um, uh, I don't remember exactly what no. it's called, Binder or something like that. Yep. So yep. I'm wondering if that's something that you uh, that you envision uh, is going to be something a quarter pub is going to support, or is this going to be something that that web that we're going to use web R for? Um, uh, I think. Oh, that's a good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there's. I think right now Quarto is kind of orthogonal to all that. You can integrate Quarto with those workflows. Um, mm -hmm. I do think though that if we can get this is, goes back to the previous question. If we can get a lot of people using Quarto and kind of standardizing on, on that as the way they, they write their documents and collaborate over documents, then we definitely have a chance to facilitate, to make it easy as a sort of this pit of success idea where mm -hmm. we say, oh, I'm already using this, you know, the Quarto online you know, collaboration system. Oh, look, it's really easy to map my work to a container and let other people reproduce it. So I think once we have kind of the writing and computing and writing workflow, uh, then we can explore making it like really easy to adopt some of these other workflows. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I, I love this pit of success idea, and um, and I think one common workflow that you'll see of people using our medicine is that you, that we 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 really we're really big fans of RedCap as a yeah. data capture yep. solution, and then getting data out of RedCap into tidy tables. Yeah. And then uh, analyzing the whole thing reproducibly in a quarto uh, document, I think is what I think yeah. what I at least envision yeah. to be a workflow yeah. to be. And it would be really great if you could create a quarto project that already anticipates that this yeah. is the workflow that you're going right. to use. That's right. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Cool. Uh, then Peter Higgins is asking: Will most of the formats from articles get ported to quarto, and will the interactive web exercises package, which works in Bookdown, work in quarto? Um, so we, yeah, we've done about six, there's 40 formats in articles and we've done about six of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that we, um, some of those articles formats are very hard coded to just LaTeX. Like they're not, they're not thinking about the web. They're using LaTeX macros everywhere. And some of them are like a version of the format that was good for the person who was creating a paper, but isn't super general. So I, we're taking more time to, to implement these. So they're more expensive. Um, so we would like, we need help with that. Basically, I would say, I think we are, we've created six, we're, we're going to continue to create them, but we're also going to be cultivating others to, to help out with that. So, um, we're, and we'll try to set some standards for like, let's make sure this can definitely target HTML. You know, let's make sure that it uses the author and affiliation schema correctly, et cetera. So, and then in terms of web exercises, it's, if depending on what that uses, I don't know what underlying tech that uses if it's if it's some kind of a HTML widget or what have you it's likely that it will work like HTML widgets do work um, um, we have a version of shiny that works inside um, Cordo as well 
So probably, and certainly, um, yes, we would want either literally web exercises if we can get it to work, to work, or something like it. Cool. And then Peter's uh, 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 shooting a comment more than a question. We'd love to see Docker containers for Redcap scientific project yeah. became yeah. become a bit of yeah. success. Absolutely. So absolutely, yeah. 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 Peter and I are of one mind here. Um, <laughs> Great. So I don't see any additional questions in the Q&A. Let's see if there's something in the chat. We have uh, another four minutes to the break. Okay. Um, all right. So Frank Carroll says, outstanding presentation. Uh, uh, quarter has already been a game changer for my work. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's see. There's something new. Okay. All right. I think if there's no more questions, then I want to thank you uh, uh, so so much for coming and and Oops. giving this uh, giving this keynote address. Uh, I think a lot of us are very excited about Quarto. Uh, so uh, so thanks thanks for uh, thanks for coming and uh, and giving us the rundown. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to what you guys are going to come up with in the next year or so. I'm I'm even more looking forward to seeing what you all do do with this stuff. Awesome. It's okay. Pretty cool to see already. So, sweet. Yeah. So, so uh, we're gonna break until um, thirty-two after the hour, uh, and then we'll come back uh, together with uh, with the next presentation. Great. Thanks.